the price has increased 10% uh, per kilo. Over the past five years, food prices have risen over 10%. The rise compared to last year, about 50% increase. What's causing the price hikes? If you think it's only climate change or inflation, well, think again. Oh. <laughs> the reasons behind food price hikes are unexpected. Shocking. And scandalous. Untuk benih kerang yang dihantar ke negeri-negeri lain di luar kawasan Johor ini, mereka diberikan permen untuk menghantar. Tetapi berdasarkan sifat tamak yang ada yang ingin menyuduk ke kawasan Thailand. I'm Leonard Young. It's bloody heavy. <laughs> a self-taught cook and a natural-born foodie. Please come and try the laksa. And I'm on a mission to find out what the food price hikes are really about. It's frustrating and confusing because we are facing a shortage. In this episode... Bloody heavy. <laughs> it's so heavy. I discover how farmers are bearing the burden of producing our bananas in the Philippines. Sila kasi yung nang ano nang takda ng presyo ng ng saging kasi nakakontrata. Masyadong mababa ang presyo ng saging ngayon ng bili ng kumpanya. Wala magawa ang mga mayari ng lupa. I unveil the crushing reality behind rising sugarcane prices. While the rest of Singapore sleeps, the day's freshest fruits from all over the world are pouring in. This is Pasir Panjang Wholesale Centre, Singapore's main fruit and vegetable distribution point. From here, imported produce eventually makes its way to our wet markets and neighbourhood fruit stalls. To help me navigate this sprawling complex, retailer Ben Poir agreed to be my guide. And what, what do you do here? I do fruits and vegetables. Okay. Uh, it's a second generation family business. Okay. It has been running for the past 30 years. So should we go check out your warehouse? Sure, take a look. Here. Okay, so out of all these fruits, which one is your most popular? Ah, bananas. Bananas, okay. So let's have a look. Um, okay, so I can see that there's quite a few boxes here. Uh, where are your bananas from? Uh, it's mainly from the Philippines. There are over 1,000 types of bananas in the world. But in Singapore, Ben says that most shops carry two types. The Malaysian Pisang Berangan or Chestnut Bananas and the Philippine Cavendish Bananas. Which one is most popular? I think the most popular will be a Philippines banana. Because of their appearance, they look almost perfect. They are less blemishes, less scratches compared to the Malaysian one. For Malaysian bananas, there's black spots which in our term is called sugar spots. Not many people know that more of the black spots, right, is equates to sweeter bananas. Not many consumers are willing to accept the outlook of the bananas. And how has the demand been over the last few years? Actually, the demand has been increasing as well, from one pallet to, to right now I'm selling probably two pallets a day. Okay, so it's almost double. Uh. Correct. Okay, and what about the price? Okay, the, for the past three years, it has been increasing for average around 25%. But as an end consumer, how does that really affect me? Actually, it works out to around 50 cents a kg more compared to the past three years. Are you absorbing any of the cost or is it being passed down to the end consumer? We try on our side to try to absorb the cost, but 
for the increase of 25%, we have to pass it on to our customers. So the price of bananas have increased by 25% in the last three years. But it's not the rise in price that Ben is concerned about. It's the supply. The supply of bananas has been falling. In the past year, of the 40 boxes of bananas Ben normally orders per day, his supply has only been providing half. And what happens when you, know, you just don't have enough bananas to supply to your customers? Okay, you'll just have to say sorry to the customers. <laughs> There's no other thing. No I bananas can... for you today. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> yeah. To find out what's causing the banana shortage, I travel to the Philippines, where majority of our bananas are grown. This is Compostela Valley, located in the southern Philippines. It's known as the banana capital of the country. About 65% of the bananas exported from the Philippines are grown here. When I first handled this farm, the yield dito is uh, about 4,000 boxes per hectare per year, which is a good yield. 42-year-old Mauro Jonas inherited a banana farm from his father. He is one of the thousands of small-scale farmers here. And then it kept on increasing. On the next year, I, I got 6,020 boxes, which is the highest yield here in the whole Dakudao area. So I, I was really proud. But just four years into the business, his farm was hit by a deadly disease. We sold our land, parcel of land, just to be able to recover, to pay the salaries of the people, and then replant and replant. Basta hanggang saan lang abutin yung aming financing, talagang wala uh, negative. It's the one disease all banana growers fear. The Panama disease. It blocks the banana's water system, causing rotting stems and wilting leaves, decimating farms all over the world. It's so aggressive because it's soil-borne, spreading through contact and worst of all, water runoff. So, sa taas doon, meron din doon na Panama disease na mga land. Tumama dito. Nakita niyo yung land na ito is rolling. So, ang lahat ng water coming from the rain, dito pumupunta sa amin. So, ito, naubos ito within one year. Itong 7.9 hectares, as in wipe out. Yung mga kasama mo na, oh, what happened? You, you have the highest yield and then now you're zero. Di ba parang masakit? Rogelio Gutierrez is a plant pathologist. He's visited many of the affected farms in the country. Ito yung kinatatakutan talaga dito, lalo na yung mga banana exporters. Dahil nga, noong panahong yun, ang Department of Agriculture is aaminin namin wala talagang alam doon sa kung paano mag spread or kumalat yung sakit. Pero ang nangyari is kalat na bago kumalat na bago pa na kagawa ng, ano, ng solusyon. So what can farmers do with this contaminated land? Itong ano, wala talaga sa ngayon, wala talagang solusyon. Ito ay eh, pag sinabi bong infected na ang area is talagang nandyan na siya forever. At kahit pa sabihin mong 30 years na yan dyan, pag tinamnan mo uli ng saging, lalabas at lalabas pa rin yan. So sa ngayon, ang tangi lang talaga magagawa nito is management. I decided to visit some farms to find out what it takes to contain the Panama disease. To avoid spreading the fungus, I had to cover my shoes before entering the affected area. I find out that this is the only way to contain the fungus by setting the affected trees on fire. It is so important for the farmers to catch early signs of Panama disease, burn the tree so that they can contain the outbreak. If left uncontained, 
This could wipe out an entire banana plantation. To date, more than 15,000 hectares of bananas in the region have been destroyed. The Philippines used to be the second largest producer of bananas in the world, after Ecuador. But after the Panama disease struck, the country dropped to number six in the global rankings. This probably explains the fall in supply of bananas to Singapore, from 23,000 tonnes in 2016 to 21,000 tonnes the following year. Because the disease has no cure, farmers are advised to replace their crop with a more resistant variety. More resistant, but also more expensive, with a lower yield. Pero hindi ibig sabihin na resistant yan is hindi na siya tatamaan o hindi na siya tatamaan ng sakit. Tatamaan pa rin siya pero hindi gaya nung, nung susceptible variety na 50 to 100 percent is kayang ma-infect ng sakit. Pero itong resistant variety is nasa 40 percent, hanggang 40 percent, 20 to 40 percent. The disease struck in 2016, but till today, Maro is still battling the plague. Every hectare na itanim mo, it's about uh, 350,000 per hectare ang uh, expenses. So lumobo talaga yung utang namin without income. So yun po, so yung mga aming salaries ko minsan na delay And then kung minsan yung kanilang benefits, uh, we are paying them quarterly kasi hindi namin kaya. So ganun po kahirap man. Wait a minute. If the cost of bananas are going up in Singapore, shouldn't farmers like Mauro be compensated? Where is our money going to? I'm in Compostela Valley, the banana capital of the Philippines. I wanted to know just why our bananas have become more expensive. Early on, I found out that the Panama disease has crippled the industry severely, causing prices to rise. But at the same time, the farmer I met says he's still making a huge loss. I need to find out why. So I just want to find out more about the whole process of growing bananas for export. So how much it costs to grow bananas? Because you know these are questions that you don't really um, think about when you buy bananas in Singapore. I managed to catch 33-year-old Eliza Diayon, a banana farmer tending two hectares of land in the area. To pass the stringent quality checks of our supermarkets, farmers like him take great care of the fruits every step of the way. Sa pagtanim ng ano ng saging, napakahirap lagaan. Kailangan talaga na lagyan ng ano plastic silupin kasi pag hindi mo nilagyan, magkaroon niya ng uh, old growth. Yun, uh, nilagyan natin ng uh, newspaper o dyaryo kasi ano kasi yung ano mas pabor siya sa araw, magkaroon siya ng uh, sunburn. So yung plastic na ginagamit, yung blue, yung pang takip, kailangan din siyang lagyan ng ganyan kasi makapapasok yung langgam, yung ants, yung bat. So may chemical din yan. I came just in time to help Eliza harvest bananas in his farm. Harvesting is done manually and padded carriers are used to prevent the fruits from bruising. Down, 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 down,
<laughs> it's so heavy. Feels like a giant sack of rice that you kind of have to keep like balancing the weight, otherwise it just slips off your your shoulder. So it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> While we were harvesting, the smell of chemicals wafted through the air. And then... The plane is flying really, really close to us. Um, which is a bit worrying. The plane was spraying... pesticides. Eliza didn't pay for this. In fact, he can't afford to pay for the pesticides and fertilizers needed to grow export quality bananas. To finance their operations, small scale farmers like Eliza enter into contracts with multinational companies. In the contract, Eliza agrees to sell his bananas exclusively to the company. In return, the company grants loans for services like crop dusting. <laughs> but it seems to me, while great care is taken to protect the fruits, the same level of care is not extended to the farmers. Isn't that dangerous for you guys? Sa katunayan, na dinapuan ako ng sakit na yung pagpanghina ng aking katawan, Kaya na sa isang linggo, bihira na akong makapasok kasi ano na ang aking katawan, magsusuka ka. Tapos ang yung dito mo, uh, ano palaging uga. So mahirapan kang ano, lumunok ng yung laway. So in nine years, the company never issued you any PPE? So ganun ang nangyari na hindi na masuot yung mga PPE ng mga workers kasi sira na. Uh, dapat unta ang ihatag nila is uh, uh, twice a year, mm -hmm. pero ang nahitabo ka ron, once a year. Uh, we have to go okay. to... Let's do it. <laughs> okay. How much do you get paid for the work that we did just now? So, karon ang sa ang uh, palitan sa sa mga growers to company is na lang siya sa 180 pesos per boxes. Sila kasi yung nag, uh, ano, nagtakda ng presyo ng, uh, ng saging kasi uh, nakakontrata. Masyadong mababa ang presyo ng saging ngayon ng bili ng kumpanya. So walang, walang magawa ang uh, mga may-ari ng lupa. So what are your plans for the future? So kana, sa ngayon, uh, yan, naghahanap ako ng, ano, ng trabaho na mas malaki ang, ang kita na sa ganitong sahod na tinatanggap ko araw-araw. So, kahit sa pagkain, hindi pa siya kasiya. These vast plantations were previously fully owned and run by multinational companies. Thanks to a land distribution program in the late 90s, small-scale farmers now own almost half of these banana farms in the Philippines. <laughs> but like Eliza, Many of these farmers don't have the capital to produce bananas. Entering into contracts with multinational companies is supposed to help. But the capital the companies provide comes with a costly caveat. Farmers have to agree to sell their bananas at a fixed price. A price locked in for 15 years. Kung ilan din ang mga chemicals, mga materialis nga nagamit nila sa ilahang uh, sa kanilang mga uh, lupa na tinatamin ng tinataniman ng saging, ayun uh, ikinakaltas yon sa kumpanya. So kaya nga nga medyo mahinahirapan na ang mga may-ari ng lupa dito. Oh my god. Irvin Sagarino is a lawyer working with Ideals. Ideals partnered with Oxfam to review farming contracts between growers and their buyer companies. 
problema lang kay dili sila makakuha dito tungod kay sa kontrata dili sila makuha problema ang price nga gina-impose sa sa companies mag nagdepende pod kung pila tong presyo sa company 45,000 farmers like Eliza locked into contracts with multinational companies So plague or otherwise, they are paid a fixed price for their banana harvest. If that's the case, then why are we paying more for bananas in Singapore? Ang makita ni mo manggod, ang banana farmers, wala gid sila nag-improve sa ilahang situation or financial standing for so long a time. Pila katuig, anak ragigyapon sila. Pero ang kumpanya, mga kumpanya, nag-expand permanente. Ang problema is maglisod o kuha ang ideas o sakto nga data. Tungod anak nga wala tay, wala may tarong nga data, di po gini makaingon kung asa gid na adto ang pinakadako nga share sa profit kay wala lagi tay data of course dili man mo dili man pud mo release pud ana ang pan kumpanya a full 13 kilograms of bananas harvested from a tree only earns a farmer 3 US dollars in singapore that would retail for 11 times that price To find out where the money we are paying is going to, I follow the banana value chain. Right after harvesting, bananas are sent to packing plants owned by large export companies. Here, workers sort, wash, and pack the fruits before they are sent our way. This process is hard to mechanize because bananas are easily damaged. So without the legions of banana packers, the entire production chain would come to a halt. And sometimes it does. Some 200 banana packers are on strike. They are fighting for something many employees usually take for granted. They have been packers for years and they're fighting to be hired as regular staff, not freelancers under contract. I sat down with them to understand their situation. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for letting me be a part of this meeting. I really just want to find out more about some of the problems that you face on a day-to-day -day basis. Karamihan, marami talagang mga manggagawa na walang kasiguruhan sa trabaho. Yung mga contractual worker, nakakontrata yung mga agency doon sa principal employer, sa mga big companies. Halimbawa, kung putulin o i-terminate ang kontrata ng mga big companies doon sa kakontrata nilang mga agency, wala na. Wala nang trabaho. Napakahalaga kung direct direct yung employ, employment mo dun sa principal employer. May protesta po kami sa malaking kumpanya dahil hindi kami kinilalang kanilang workers. It has been a decade since the workers filed their case in court. But finally, it appears the law is on their side. In June last year, the Philippine Supreme Court judged that there was substantial evidence that an employer-employee relationship existed between a major exporter and its banana packers. The court order compels the banana exporter to give in to the demands of these packers. That is, convert those on contract for more than six months into regular employees. And with that, also comply with labor laws on wages. For years, the banana packers are paid under two US dollars a day, three times below the legal minimum.
Imagine, what we pay for a bunch of bananas in Singapore is what many banana packers are paid for an entire day of work. If so little of what we pay goes to the farmers and packers, then where has the money gone to? I tried to dig deeper into the money trail by speaking to Stephen Antik. He is the director of the Association of the Big Banana Exporters in the Philippines. He claims that they are also tied to a fixed price through contracts with the wholesalers or importers in Singapore. The big corporate farms sign contracts with importers on a yearly basis and prices are set annually. And uh, that has always been uh, a sore point because there was a time when we were proposing that uh, there should be a sharing of the profit. Mm -hmm. But they never agreed to open their books. And, and, and for that reason, we also did not uh, bother to insist. Otherwise, it might uh, uh, affect the relationship. So from the point where the banana is grown to the point where it is sold in the supermarket, which part of this supply chain actually takes the biggest cut? It's a known fact that the wholesalers are actually breaking it in. The usual explanation is we have to take care of, of the, the from, from, from the warehouse, we have to take care of the distribution to the retailers and it entails a lot of, of costs. Unfortunately, this is where the money trail ends. The banana exporters from the Philippines blame the global importers for setting the price and jacking up their profit margins, while the importers return the blame. Despite trying for months, neither side are willing to show any concrete numbers. What's for certain is that neither the farmers nor the packers are benefiting from the higher prices. So what can we as consumers do? My trip to the Philippine banana plantation was an eye-opener. I found out how farmers like Eliza Diayon are legally bound to accept a fixed price by big corporations for their bananas. Wait, please, please. This year, Oxfam published its findings, revealing that banana farmers in the Philippines are food insecure, meaning that they or a family member had gone without food in the previous month. So I usually get bananas maybe like once a week. And now that I know that I've been paying more for them and that most of my money doesn't go to the farmers or the workers, it really makes me want to change the way that I shop. So I'm visiting Ryan's Grocery, a shop that does things a little bit differently. The recurring story we get is that the farmers are always very, very poor. Um, do you think that there's anything that can be done to combat this? In Rice Grocery, we make an effort to vet through all our suppliers, uh, the farmers and the producers. Well, I guess start by organic will be the first thing we can start. Yeah. Because most important, we took care of their welfare. I think yeah. the chemicals is a big thing. I think the next thing is about fair trade. Okay. Um, I think if you buy from fair trade, that would be great. But at the moment, Singapore, Singaporeans do not know much about fair trade. Can you just briefly sort of explain what fair trade is for people that don't know? Actually, fair trade is about uh, being fair the whole process. Okay. As we all know, a lot of commodities growers, yeah. um, the farmers are not paid well. So I think fair trade guarantees that they deserve what um, they produce. Under fair trade, farmers are guaranteed a minimum price per box of bananas, while Filipino farmers tied in contracts earn as little as 3 US dollars per box of bananas. On average, fair trade farmers in Colombia and Ecuador are earning double that amount. There's just one small problem. In this part of the world, 
um, you do not have many fair trade growers actually. There are fair trade bananas actually, uh, but they're either from South America, Africa or the Caribbean countries. But then it just doesn't justify you know, the carbon footprint to actually have them ship over or Africa to, to Singapore. Unfortunately, in Singapore, it seems that no matter where we get our bananas, there just won't be any fair trade ones available, at least for now. But that doesn't mean that this trip has been for nothing, because we've taken a big first step in realizing the imbalance of power and profit in the banana supply chain. Bananas aren't the only thing we're paying more for. The next time you visit your local hawker centre, pay attention to how much you're paying for your drinks. So how's the fish? Spicy, yeah. I'll just try this. Spicy. Oh, I I'm sweating already, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hope that the sugar cake is coming soon. Mm. Racing is one of the three founders of Daily Fresh a company that sources and delivers sugarcane stocks to our hawker centres. Uh, if it's at the peak period of 8pm, right, you'll see that I think 80% or 90% of the table, they are having sugarcane juice. Do you know why that is? Part of it is because one thing is a, a, lot, a lot of youngsters okay. come into here. So for the youngster, right, if they are not 18 years, you know, yeah. they could, couldn't have beer, right? They just came here and have sugarcane tower. There are six other companies delivering sugarcane to Singapore daily. But Daily Fresh alone delivers enough sugarcane to make 50,000 litres of sugarcane juice. Mm. Oh, I see it. Oh. Our tower is here. Oh, this is Mr. Brandon. Hey, Mr. Brandon, very nice to meet yeah, you. Yeah. He's one of our customer, loyal customer, and he owns the bigger sugar cane store in Hong Kong. Have a seat, have a seat. Join us, join um, us. So how do you actually come about creating this sugar cane tower? So last time we used to sell around smaller cup. Okay. Then slowly, slowly we get upsize to bigger size, 700 ml to 1 litre, then slowly 1.5 litre. So people are looking for another, another jug, so maybe we can try a, a tower. So I'm curious, how much does this tower cost? This one costs around eighteen dollars. Okay. Used to be fifteen dollars okay. but the price increase are, uh, I think, around fifty percent, uh. Fifty percent. Yeah, fifty percent. Okay. In the two decades that Brandon Tan has been selling sugar cane, this is the first time that he has raised prices. Since November last year, the price of one box of sugar cane rose from twelve to twenty-one US dollars. That's a 75% price increase. That's a big so, difference. Yeah. Okay. So no choice that we have to increase. So why has there been an increase in because, this price? Because uh, there's this uh, <coughs> sugar cane shortage this year. Okay. It has never happened so seriously before, from what okay. we have understood. But for others, like some of my customers in other hawker centers, they are like selling uh, three days in a week. The other four days, they got no supply to sell. Or even when they have, right, they are selling like until lunchtime mm. because they only get the one or two boxes only. Mm. As I finished the last sip of my drink, I couldn't help but wonder, are we about to run out of sugarcane? Sugarcane grows best in the western side of Malaysia. Other than Negri Sembilan, some of the sugarcane growing areas include Perlis, Kedah, Perak, and Moa. To find out what's been happening at the sugarcane farms, I travelled to Jalabu, Negri Sembilan, about four hours away from Singapore. Saya uh, interesting sebab uh, saya ambil dari peniagaan bapa saya dulu. Saya dah dilatih dari kecil lah, dari uh, sekolah rendah lagi saya dah dilatih. Ayah saya ni dulu dulu memang Pengusaha tebu yang terbesar lah kira kat sini. Setakat ni orang kata kalau sebut nama ayah saya tu orang kenal lah. Muhammad Farid's family has been farming sugarcane since the 1970s. 
Sebab saya dah pernah buat di tempat lain dan dia punya kualiti tebu tu tak sebaiklah kualiti tebu dekat sini. Being next to the river helps Farid secure enough water for his sugarcane. Sugarcane requires as much as five times the amount of water used to grow other crops. Yet, too much water can also create problems. Cuma kesusahan dia yang paling susah yang setakat ni saya pernah alami lah. Uh, saya untuk recover balik masa banjir itu. Last December, it rained continuously for five days. The unusual downpour flooded Farid's sugarcane farm, leaving his crop vulnerable. Nak menangis pun ada, nak Orang kata nak menjerit sekuat-kuat hati pun ada, memang fras gila lah, memang Orang kata memang Terlalu-lalu kecewa lah, memang Biasanya dia memang akan rosak lah Tebu tu rosak, dia akan jadi masam pun ada, rosak Farid's farm was flooded again in February this year, along with many other farms in the low-lying Jelebu area. Kedalaman uh, untuk banjir biasanya cuma tiga uh, ke empat kaki. Okay, kita akan potong setengah lah untuk saya kerahkan satu tempat ke satu tempat. Dah siap tempat ni pergi ke tempat ni. Dua puluh orang pergi sekali. On average, farmers like Farid were only able to save 30% of their crop during each flood. With supply cut by two-thirds due to the unprecedented repeat flooding, the price of a sugarcane stock went up by nearly four times, from 36 cents to $1.30 in US dollars. But in the near future, we might have to pay even more to get our sugar cane fix. As I visited more farms, I realized that many of them are on the brink of closing. Many sugar cane farms in Malaysia are family-run businesses. Saya menanam tebu ni memang saya tak ada pengalaman. Memang orang cakap kosong lah. Saya berasal daripada seorang pemandu lori. Muhammad Arif takes pride in running his two-hectare sugarcane farm because he does it with the help of only one person, his 50-year-old wife, Simisa. However, Arif struggles to send freshly cut sugarcane to his buyers. Sugarcane is best sent for processing within eight hours of harvest. Perancangan lah. Mesti ada perancangan lah awal kan. Kalau dia minta pada hari Rabu macam tu, kalau permintaan tu banyak, mungkin hari Isnin kita dah mula tebang lah. Nah, kalau kurang, mungkin hari Selasa petang kita mula tebang lah macam tu. However, age is slowly catching up on Arif. At 55, he might not be able to keep running the farm much longer. He has four sons, but not one plans to take over the family business. Ah, dia tak suka macam sistem tanam tebu ni. Hari ni kerja tujuh bulan besok baru dapat dia punya hasil atau duit dia kan? Apa gitu juga dengan anak-anak saya sebab dia lebih suka bekerja dengan makan gaji kan sebab di kalangan anak saya 
empat lelaki yang ada sekarang ni empat-empat bekerja sebagai makan gaji dan bekerja dengan kerajaan kan. Uh, jadi dia orang masih lebih senang macam tu berpakaian kemas orang cakap kalau ke kebun tak dapatlah nak smart kan. <laughs> After spending three days meeting sugarcane farmers, I can see why Aris' children would willingly give up all of this. As you can see, it's, it's kind of a nightmare because like, even though the sugarcane is really nicely and very neatly planted, like these leaves that you can see, I'm going to show you real quick. These leaves are just like, they're really, really sharp and they're kind of like jutting out and poking you in the face. It's also like smack in the middle of the, the day. The sun is out. Um, the weather is really, really brutal. Uh, I can kind of see why the locals um, don't really want to work here. They don't want to, they don't want to go through all the hard work. In bigger sugarcane farms, owners like Tan Wee Tik are left with no choice but to rely on foreign labour. Okay. Literally, you have to cut one stick at a time, and I, this must be really, really time consuming. Yeah, we pay, pay, she tell Xian Chang. So, it's not a Tiao Chan, it's some Yen Gong, Tuan Che, Miu, Miu, Yen Gong. Hmm, with some Miu and Yao Zhuo. Tai Zhe, Tai Xin Ku. There is also a shortage of workers for processing sugarcane, a highly labor intensive task. So you now are doing what? We are now to sell pea. Sell pea? Why is the pea taken out? It's more clean, but it can't be sold. It's just the part of the water. It's not that clean. Is it okay? Yes. The owner of the farm can you take the pea? No, we don't use the pea. Why? Because the pea is clean. It's not clean. It's not clean. Back in 2006, Tan had around 30 workers in his 40 hectare farm. Many of his workers were Indonesians. Then you sent Sai Gong Sali Mio Jigaran. Then I sent Zichen Tong San Si Tao Sien Sai the Sisuka Yijing Jian Ban. Sugarcane farmers are finding it harder to hire foreign workers. In the last few years, Malaysian authorities have been cracking down on undocumented migrants in the country. In order to cope with the labour shortage, Tan Wee Tik was forced to half the size of his farm, from 40 hectares to 20 hectares. Uh, so here's what I've learned so far. The smaller, family-run sugarcane farms are in danger of closing. Larger sugarcane farms have started to downsize because of the labour shortage. And, as it turns out, even middlemen down the supply chain are throwing in the towel. Yap Siong Shi sources his sugarcane from farms in southern Malaysia. But barely a year into supplying sugarcane to Singapore, he had to close his shop because of the decreasing supply of sugarcane. We go to the far place to buy. Far, very far, like Pahang, like Perak. So your petrol, your diesel, the worker, everything will be become the more expensive things for me. So that we calculate that one process actually we have lost around three to four dollar. So you can count that two hundred bosses we time three dollar. So there is around six hundred dollar per day that we have lost. So how much per month I can lose? So we cannot sustain this so that we choose to close down this business. In Singapore, two suppliers also called it quits and were absorbed by Daily Fresh. 
I spoke to Ray Sung, a co-founder of the company. I want to know how Daily Fresh is getting its supply of sugarcane. To gain their trust is not easy. Some of them reject, even reject us. I mean, uh, they don't even want to talk to us. They have encountered a lot of uh, new players that come into the market and uh, die off very fast. But eventually, we did manage to convince a few companies. Ray tells me that Daily Fresh had to pay the farms in advance to secure their share of sugarcane. But I don't think that there will be a day that Singapore, that we are going to have no sugarcane juice at all. I mean, those are farmers as close now, right? There will be somebody who is going to come into the market again to play the game. We ourselves are planning to plant the sugarcane ourselves. So the next planning is to get lands and plant our own sugarcane and farm it. It will not cover everything, but it will counter part of the problem. According to supplier Daily Fresh, consumers like you and me are only footing one-fifth of the sugarcane price hike, driven by bad weather. But even if the weather takes a turn for the better, the current model of farming sugarcane in small family holdings may well be a thing of the past. The big boys may step in. But with an eye on the bottom line, whether they can keep the supply going may well depend on how much we are willing to pay.